This week, Senate President Earl Ray Tomlin had his first public appearance since the election. When the election results are certified, Joe Manchin will resign as West Virginia's governor and by law, Tomlin will take his place. In this week's cover story, Erica Peterson reports that Tomlin will be passing on many of his duties as president to focus on the executive branch. Question for the Senator, shall the resolution be adopted? All those in favor will say aye. Opposed no, the ayes have it. I declare the resolution adopted. Tomlin, a Democrat from Logan County, has been in the West Virginia Senate since 1980 and has served as its president since 1995. He says during his time as governor, he'll focus on broadening West Virginia's energy policies. We need to foster policies where we appropriately balance the interest of protecting our environment while extracting energy resources so desperately needed by our, our country. West Virginia is blessed with an abundance of energy resources, including coal, natural gas, oil, as well as wind and solar power. And we must continue to take advantage of these resources and make West Virginia stronger. He also cited past work the legislature has done on business and education and indicated he'd like to continue that work. I'm very proud of, of some of the accomplishments we've made in West Virginia. As I mentioned in my remarks, uh, when I became finance chair, this state was virtually bankrupt. We were not paying our uh, debts, uh, our, our uh, invoices on time. Our uh, retirement system was in shambles. We've been able to address those problems. We got our, our debt under control right now, even though we're not uh, completely out of debt. We've got it headed in the right direction. We've been able to do some innovative things like create our infrastructure council, our school building authority, create the Promise Scholarship, and been able to live within our means along with, uh, along, at the same time, uh, been able to reduce tax, uh, the taxes on our citizens out there. I will continue to do that, to try to make West Virginia a business-friendly state and try to uh, do what we can to make sure that our children are educated uh, to their, their full potential. Tomlin says he won't preside over Senate floor sessions. He'll technically remain president, but will turn most of his senatorial duties over to the president pro tem, Senator Joe Menard. Menard says it'll be an adjustment, but he's up to the challenge. The West Virginia Senate is probably one of the greatest deliberative bodies in this country. We have a smooth running machine right now. Uh, we have been really the backbone of this state in, in being responsible, and I don't see any reason to make any changes. If it's not broke, you don't fix it. No one is sure how long Tomlin will occupy the governor's mansion. Some constitutional experts say it's not necessary to hold an election until 2012. Others, including House Speaker Richard Thompson, are calling for one sooner. Tomlin says he'll expect people to let their legislators know what they want. For me, it comes down to what the people want. If my fellow West Virginians express an overwhelming desire to have a quick election, I will work with the legislature to make that a reality. We must, however, take a reasoned and thoughtful approach to our decision-making process. We must keep in mind the potential costs, timing, and what is in the best interest of West Virginia. But there's one thing Tomlin was certain of during the news conference. When asked if he was interested in running for a full term as governor, he gave a one-word answer. Absolutely. Other legislators have already indicated their interest in running in the next election, including Thompson. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Erica Peterson in Charleston. The state code and the state constitution. Our discussion in a moment. Coming soon to Independent Lens. Two adopted Crow Indian brothers die mysteriously on a train track. Just a terrible, terrible thing. You never forget things like that. 30 years later, their brother reopens the cold case, unearthing a painful family secret. He just ruined my life, that's all. I'm so sorry, but I never knew. Lost Sparrow. Join us Tuesday at 10. For over 40 years, Washington Week has delivered the most interesting conversation and political analysis of the week. Join host Gwen Ifill and discover why Washington Week is the longest running primetime news and public affairs program on television. That's Friday at 8.30. 
We're interested in your comments about This Week in West Virginia and all our news and public affairs programming. Send us an email to feedback at wvpubcast.org or mail a letter to 600 Capitol Street, Charleston, West Virginia, 25301. We look forward to hearing from you. One guest tonight says there's a conflict between the state code and the state constitution about gubernatorial succession. The other says the constitution is clear. Joining us tonight from Morgantown is Robert Bastris, a professor at the West Virginia University School of Law. And joining us in our studio is Thornton Cooper, an attorney from South Charleston. Gentlemen, welcome. Glad you're both here. I have Good evening. Beth. Good evening, Good evening Beth. I have here Article 7, Section 16 of the state state constitution, vacancy and governorship how filled. Let's read it. In case of the death conviction or impeachment, failure to qualify, resignation, or other disability of the governor, the president of the Senate shall act as governor until the vacancy is filled or the disability removed. And if the president of the Senate for any of the above named causes shall become incapable of performing the duties of governor, the same shall devolve upon the Speaker of the House of Delegates, and in all other cases where there is no one to act as governor, one shall be chosen by joint vote of the legislature. Whenever a vacancy shall occur in the office of governor before the first three years of the term shall have expired, a new election for governor shall take place to fill the vacancy. That's the language from the Constitution. Robert Bastris, in your opinion, what does this mean? Well, I think it means that the governor shall act shall be the acting governor until we can fill the uh, vacancy by a new election. And I t interpret that language, the last sentence, to require a special election when the vacancy occurs during the first three years. Otherwise, that, that sentence makes no sense. What, how, how, do you, how do you mean it makes no sense? Well, why have a three-year period in which you're going to fill the vacancy by an election if you're going to wait until two months before the end of the term to have the election? And it also it mean, it creates this um, distinct tension between Article Five and Article Seven, Section Teen, Section Sixteen. If you read it to say that the acting governor can remain in office for almost two years uh, while remaining the Senate or the Senate president, uh, it, it and of course that the tension it creates is with Article Five, which uh, it creates and requires a separation of powers, uh -huh. uh, and and that no. Two, no one person shall serve in two different branches of the government at the same time. All right. uh, our section 16 is an exception to that, but contemplated for just a very short period of time, the minimum we need to, uh, to get a, a special election together. Thornton Cooper, how do you interpret this portion of the Constitution? Well, I, I believe that I, I strongly agree with what Professor Bassers just said. Basically, when the constitutional provision was ratified in 1872, the last sentence uh, was put in there, and I think the people, when they ratified the Constitution, very clearly understood that should a vacancy occur within the first 36 months of the term of the governor, that there would be another prompt election uh, following the, uh, the creation of the vacancy. And so you think the election should be promptly? How, how prompt? Well, within a few months, what I had suggested to the uh, Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate and the current governor, uh, several months ago I sent notice that I would be planning to file a lawsuit if they didn't do this, but that once the vacancy occurred, there'd be a 30-day period to file for governor, then after that filing period ended, then there'd be a 60-day period, to, at, at the end of that 60-day period you'd have a primary election, and then after another 60-day period, the end of that, you would have the general election. Okay. So if they had moved, been on their toes, we could have gotten this all done by Memorial Day 2011. Unfortunately, they have not done that. Mr. Bastris, how do you feel about Mr. Cooper's interpretation of this particular issue? Well, I, I would agree with him that an election should be held as, as prompt as, as would be feasibly possible. I don't know that you could extract the specific times um, in, from Article 7, Section 16. It's, it seems to me this should be a, a topic of, uh, uh, of discussion and, and 
action uh, at the outset of the legislative session in January. Right, the legislature is going to have to talk about this. Now we do have... Y y yes, you, you need a legislative solution here. <laughs> well, Chapter uh, 3, you say you don't need a legislative well, solution? because of their failure to act. I mean, that I believe since 1875 the uh, statute has been in conflict with the Constitution. But they do give lip service to that sentence you've read. It is actually in 3-10-2 as well, but the rest of 3-10-2 seems to be uh, inc inc inconsistent with the provision in uh, the last uh, uh, sentence of the constitutional section. State Code, Chapter 3, Article 10, Section 2, Vacancy in Office of Governor. It basically reads like the state constitution. Whenever a vacancy shall occur in the office of governor before the first three years of the term shall have expired, a new election for governor shall take place to fill the vacancy. If the vacancy shall occur more than 30 days next preceding a general election, the vacancy shall be filled at such election. So what about the state code here? Um, Mr. Bastris, it seems as though it's pretty clear that a new election for governor shall take place to fill the vacancy. That's in the Constitution. Uh, but still, in state code, there's nothing to tell us when an election should well, be held. Well, no, I think the code, Section 3102, uh, specifies that the, quote, new election will be the next general election. And uh, I, I think that's an incorrect reading. The, um, the, the general election would fill, the, uh, the next general election would fill the vacancy only if it occurs during the, uh, if the vacancy occurs during the last year. And, and 3102 creates a real anomaly because we end up having two campaigns, primary and general election for governor in 2012, and one of them would be to elect uh, the governor for a two-month lame duck term. I mean, that makes no sense at all. Uh, it seems to me to be wasteful, and it, it also uh, contradicts what the clear intent of Section 16 was, and that was to make sure that the people made the decision um, to elect the governor. Mm -hmm. And we have a long tradition of electing our executive officers, and. Mm -hmm and Section 16 implements that tradition. Mr. Cooper? Well, I, I agree with Professor Bastos. Indeed, between the 1863 Constitution and the 1872 Constitution, we had general elections every year. You, you, you elect the delegates one year and you elect senators mm -hmm. two years later. And after the 1872 Constitution was ratified, uh, we, you, you actually had two general elections in some years because the general election for everybody but the president and the vice president was in late October and the, uh, the election for the president and vice president was in November. So sometimes you'd have two general elections just a few days apart uh, for a number of years till they finally start putting it all on the same day, the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November of uh, even numbered years. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying there's been a long um, history of letting the people participate. And to me, new election means within, you know, within a few months, not a year or two. Uh, down the road. So you intend to file a suit about this, a lawsuit with the state Supreme Court. Does it take you or is is somebody else also planning on taking this? I don't, I, as far as I know, I'm the only person who's complied with the statutory notice requirements propounded by the legislature several years ago. Okay. And and what, is, attorney, what are those? What, are the, what is that? That you have to give notice within like 30 or 60 days before you sue a state officer or state official or state agency. Uh, so that I guess they have time to correct their, clean up their act, and you wouldn't be a lawsuit, or, or in time to prepare to defend the, uh, the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Bastrist, this is headed for the Supreme Court. Should it go there? Not, not in my opinion, at least not now. Um, I think the court should uh, give the legislature the opportunity to, uh, to address the statute. We need a new statute. 3102 is, is it's poorly written, and it creates these uh, impossible situations, possible meaning they create opportunities for all kinds of political shenanigans, uh, and it, it needs to be rewritten. How, how would you suggest it that it be rewritten? What should it say? Well, I mean, it's obviously we're bound by the, the language of, of Section 16, uh, but I think we could fix it much the same way we fix the... Um, the election for senator um, to fill a uh, senator bird seat. I mean, that was a there. The legislature met in special session to create a um, fairly efficient procedure, um, and we, they could uh, follow what the uh, what the legislators did in in that special session. I, I think there could also be some consideration given to uh, uh, amending the constitution 
to provide for an executive officer to succeed um, the governor mm -hmm. in cases of vacancy. And then you don't have this separation of powers problem, which we currently uh, have pursuant mm -hmm. to Section 16. A question for you both. Does the state need a lieutenant governor? I don't think so. I think no. that's, a, that's a waste. <laughs> really? In fact, okay. even putting the title on the president of the Senate, I think, is very presumptuous because separation of powers indicates you don't have a person with both holding an executive branch title and a legislative branch title. And, Mr. Bastris, you agree with that? No, we, no we lieutenant We do not governor. need a lieutenant governor. No, no. There, there are about a half a dozen states, I think, I forget the exact number right now, that don't have an, a lieutenant governor, and obviously most of them are smaller states. Uh, but it's an office uh, which would have a salary, and we we don't we we haven't needed one, and we don't. Yeah, it's true. Um, the uh, West Virginia Republican Party has started a special website called Special Election Now, and the writer of this website says, without action regarding a special session, a great constitutional crisis is in store. Mr. Cooper, do you think that's accurate? Uh, well. How great a constitutional crisis, I guess, depends upon where you're coming from. But from my perspective, you're depriving over a million registered voters the opportunity to select their governor, and you're kicking it down the road till November 2012. I think that's pretty substantial. All right. Mr. Batchers, is it a great constitutional crisis, as the GOP says? Well, uh, not yet. I mean, I, I think if we create a precedent in which uh, the Senate president can serve as, can act as governor for, for close to two years, that that's a, that's a seriously bad precedent. Uh, it's, um, you know, it, and it's nothing against the person who's going to be in that office. It, it's just that it's not a healthy situation under our system of government to have a person with one leg in the executive branch and one leg in the legislative branch. Uh, that's not a good thing, and, uh, mm -hmm. and we need to find a better way to do it. This has happened before, I understand. In the state of New Hampshire, a governor resigned rather suddenly, and the Senate president became the governor, presided over the Senate, or, you know, ceded his control of the Senate, and also was governor. And from what I understand, the research I've done, it worked out pretty well. Well, I understand that, too. I, I believe it was New Jersey. I'm not yes, sure. Yes, it is it New Jersey. New Hampshire. It was New Jersey, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, the, the people who happened to take the responsibility as governor there um, may, in fact, uh, exercise power responsibly. But under our th system of government, under our separation of powers theory, uh, we want to avoid that situation because it creates the risk yeah. for um, uh, political, political manipulation and it creates the risk that too much power is going to be concentrated in one person. So much of our constitutional law is created to avoid risk. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Cooper, what should the legislature do? But the leg well, the legislature should correct the statute, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to hold up on my lawsuit. All right. I mean, they need to make the, con the, the statute completely consistent with the constitutional provision. Just because you file a lawsuit, the Supreme Court doesn't have to take it out. Absolutely not. If they want to kick me out, they can kick me out for any number of reasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's happened once or twice in my life. And then I, I would have the option of going down to Circuit Court of Kanawha County, but I hope they don't. Professor Robert Bastris of the West Virginia University School of Law and Thornton Cooper, an attorney from South Charleston. Thank you both very much. An interesting discussion. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Beth. And that's this week in West Virginia. We'd love to hear from you about this political conundrum. Email us at, at feedback at wvpubcast.org, feedback at wvpubcast.org, or address your letters to This Week in West Virginia, West Virginia Public Broadcasting, 600 Capitol Street, Charleston, West Virginia, 25301. We may use your comments on a future program. Next week, we'll take a look and discuss the situation with U.S. Route 35 that runs through Putnam and Mason counties. State officials want to place tolls on that road to pay for the upgrade but local residents are protesting that move. I'm Beth Voorhees, thanks for joining us. Good night.
The preceding has been a news and public affairs presentation of West Virginia Public Broadcasting.